early morning. Um, my name is Christoph Pettis, um, and we're talking today about living with object relational mappers. We'll talk all about what those are and why you should care. So first thing, for especially for the DBAs, you get called out to a client or an inter you know, the internal facility, and they say, "This," and they say, "Oh my God, this query is taking forever." Our DMA investors are the most horrible thing in the entire world. Why are they suck? Why do they run so slow? And you look at the query, because you go into the Postgres logs or something like that, and it's this horrible thing with 50,000 clauses in the where. It's doing all the, you know, it joins across 12 tables. And you say, well, you just need to change this where clause. And they cut you off and they say, we can't change the SQL, we're using an or. So this happens to me all the time. So we're going to talk about orms, like what one is, why we have to put up with them at all, um, what are they good at? What are the problems with them? Why can't we just make them go away? And the answer is no, you can't, sorry. Um, and how we can live with them. So uh, to introduce myself, Christoph Dennis, I'm a consultant with PostgreSQL Experts. Um, I've been there since 2009. Um, I've been using Postgres since 1998. Um, I actually still have a 7.2 instance up and running. I really shouldn't upgrade it right now, but the uptime is like, sort of become this fascination for me to see how long I can keep it going without rebooting. Um, I'm, my original background before I got into databases was an application and system architect, so I kind of like came out of that world, which has given me a somewhat more, I don't know, benign attitude towards ORMs than a lot of database people. And I actually designed ORMs for a bunch of languages. Does anyone ever remember a company called Taligent? No. <laughs> one, one person, I'm impressed. Yeah, it was a, a joint venture between Apple and IBM and HP that went absolutely nowhere in Apple's search for a new operating system. And that was one of the first, that was an ORM component back in 1993, I believe. Okay, so the first part about ORMs is, ORMs are designed to bridge two different worlds. And the a lot of the characteristics, both good and bad, about ORMs come from this intersection of them. So, the two worlds are object-oriented programming, which is what these days pretty much every new application in the vast majority of existing applications are written in a language that has some kind of OO capabilities, depending on the extent they use them. And relational database management, which is what we're all here about. So let's talk a little bit about object-oriented programming and what, what is it about OO that makes an ORM interesting or useful. Um, so, when in doubt, let's ask Wikipedia. So, object oriented programming is a programming paradigm using objects. Well, we probably could, could have kind of guessed that. Um, the problem is, if you ask three programmers what OO is, you're going to get five different answers. So, but I want to focus on something very specific here about what's going on. So, uh, the definition goes on data structures consisting of data fields and methods together with their interactions to design applications and computer programs. Okay, fair enough. So, what's the critical feature of object-oriented programming? Any responses? What, what, what if the one adjective or noun that defines No one's had coffee. Okay. <laughs> Is it data abstraction? Well, no. I would say that you can do data abstraction in almost any, in almost any design paradigm. Is it messaging? I mean, messaging is what we decided to call procedure calls because calling procedure calls seemed like something your dad did. Um, modularity, I mean, Ada had modules and it was an OO when it first came out. Um, polymorphism, I would say no, but it's getting warmer. People, you can build polymorphism on top of almost any language like C, but it's but we're getting there. Um, inheritance, no, not really. I'm going to argue that the critical feature the thing that makes an OO program different from almost any other is encapsulation. And this is regardless of the language itself, but the design paradigm of object-oriented programming. So, talk about encapsulation a bit. In encapsulation, objects export behavior, not data. Yes, plenty of languages uh, that we all, we all know and love, Python, PHP, Java, if you set it up right, if you, do, if you use public. You can get at the data in objects just fine, but the basic notion is that's an optimization. So it's a shortcut when you when you expose them. It's because you didn't feel like writing getters and setters for all this stuff, which you probably should have, but you didn't. Um, 
Objects don't always have significant behavior, but that's kind of a degenerate case. That's because a lot of languages, there is no struct, so you just use an object for, the, for passive data. And so what object-oriented programming is all about is wrapping up the behavior of the data into a single package, the object. That's what it's about. Um, this is, seems like programming 101, but it's important to understand why ORMs have the behavior they do, to understand what um, this particular characteristic of an object-oriented language. Everybody willing to at least write with me on this one? So let's talk a little bit of your running your program, and there are a bunch of objects, and what are the relationships between these guys? How are they all bound together? Basically, an object model is a collection of graphs. No big surprise there. Objects refer to each other. They're, you know, you can call them pointers or references or, you know, Swizzlers or strong refs or weak refs or, you know, blah, 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 blah. You can call them whatever you want, but, and each language has its own way of handling these kinds of references. They're direct hard pointers, they're some kind of smart pointer, they're reference counted, they're references, they're anything, depending on the language, but they all point to each other. They have these references that you follow. You know, ultimately derived from the notion of a pointer. So, Ultimately, it's all this in-memory object graph. Okay, no big surprise there. So you say, well, yeah, but okay, you can have arrays of these things and that kind of thing. And that's a different kind of relationship, and that's in some ways true. But each object has its own list of references to other objects. So you have an array object that's either either a real object or or some kind of funny language construct, depending on the language. But it's managing this array of things. Um, the, the shape of this graph is generally an application architecture decision. And what I mean by that is, when you're designing your application, you're specifying what kind of data structures are in this thing. You're not, these, these are general, the contents of the data structures obviously change dynamically all the time. It would be kind of a boring program if they didn't. But the general, the kinds of, app, of, of structures and their nature, you, you know, you write the array declaration, you populate the array. All very straightforward and boring. So the collections aren't intrinsic to the objects, but they're internal structures. So the, generally, the objects, unless the objects are dumped into the array, they, they don't have a fundamental notion of I'm an array object unless you're working on one of these old benighted OO languages that had the notion of collectible, which thankfully we've pretty much gotten away from over the years. And object classes are largely static. Now I know all the Python people are about to jump in on me, but work with me here for a second. Um, the, the classes themselves are generally static for the life of the application. You can create new class. Plenty of dynamic languages can create new classes and things like that. I understand that, but for in the general conceptual sense, the 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 list of classes of, of base classes at least are is static as for as long as the application runs. And if you create new classes, they're in reference to these existing classes. You can sometimes manufacture new classes completely on the fly, but you need specialized language tools to be able to get at them because you need some kind of specialized syntax to grab at them. You know, dynamic languages, yes, I get we, we understand that, but there's but there's still fun that these um, you it's very difficult to create a whole new class ab initio with no reference to any other class because at some point you had to syntactically write a reference to it. So and that means in these cases, it's an application change to add new methods and members to these objects. Again, dynamic languages will let you do this to an extent, but creating a new fundamental base class is basically something you do when you change your application. And generally, you have to be, is it, even, even when you're creating these new class, these subclasses, like the Django or creates a new class for every model class in it, in it um, that you use, but you, it, it's only in reference to an existing base class. Okay, how are we doing so far? Glazed over. Questions, comments? Dead silent. Okay, cool. Any views of that? Sure. Make sure of them, yeah. Oh, uh, for somebody. English second language, I guess. Okay, that's, um, yes, to make use of them. Thank you. The object instances themselves are general, are transient, um, unless you have a specific, unless you do otherwise, take other. Objects that first and foremost are in-memory data structures. Okay. They're, they're ultimately, no matter how many levels of indirection, how many different kinds of, um, of ways you have of accessing them, there's a hunk of memory that, that is the object, or hunks. Object persistence is a layer that's added on top of the object model. And 
there really isn't any production Pythagorean <coughs> language that um, assumes persistence as the default condition, where without taking any special pains, the object persists across application executions. Does anyone know of a, a contrary example? I thought I thought I couldn't think of one. Where where the um, I know the research languages and things like that, but where people you know that's a, a production language that would deploy code. I don't think there is any. Basically, everything has a persistence layer that's dropped on top of it. And even object databases, um, and, and there are uh, you know, uh, some, you have to mark the objects. And that makes sense. You don't, if for objects, languages that are use int as a primary, you don't want to assume every single instance of an int gets hammered onto a disk somewhere. The performance characteristics would probably not be delightful in that case. 